As our programs become more complex, it becomes more difficult to keep track of all of their details in our heads. As we start having many functions, some of those functions will call other functions, which call other functions, and those functions will return and return, and we need to keep track of where to go back to each time. There's just lots of details that is frankly impossible for humans to keep track of once our programs become sufficiently complex. So what we're going to do, are we're, we're going to learn a technique for tracing our programs by hand and trying to understand exactly how our program is represented in memory under the hood. And in doing so, we will help it'll help us keep track of our details. Okay? So how a program evaluates depends on systematically following the rules that our language will follow. So this will also help us learn the rules by practicing uh, carrying them out ourselves. And some rules are surprising. So doing this by hand will help you better understand and you'll find yourself less surprised in certain situations than you would if you didn't try and learn how this worked step by step. As your programs are being evaluated, there are many moving parts, right? What is the current line of code? What is the trail of function calls that led you to the point you're currently at? What are the names of all the variables and what are their values? There's just lots of details when we have non-trivial programs. For humans, it's way more than we can keep track of, uh, but the good news is we're gonna have diagrams in our pocket in order to keep track of, of, of these details and better understand what's going on. So I wanna talk through some terminology. When we think of the state of a program, we think of its values in memory. Right? So what are the values or the contents in memory? When we think of a program's environment, and I'm using this term slightly differently than we think of in the, uh, the fundamental pattern where a program is running inside of an environment. Well, inside of a program, a program has its own little environment too. And inside the program's environment, what we're saying is the program's environment are the names that we have in our program and what they're bound to in memory or what state they are bound to. So an environment diagram is going to trace both of these things, both the state, all of our values, as well as the, uh, the environment, which are what are the names and how are they bound to our values. Additionally, we'll keep track of how function calls are processed. We do this because it helps so, so much. Uh, and I was just blown away in the 2018, 2019 school year when we first started practicing these and incorporating them into the course. Students who used them on the final exam for questions where we didn't require it, we went back and looked and saw like who did try to use a, an environment diagram versus who didn't. They did 50%, they were 50% less likely to make an error on questions where we asked students to trace through uh, how certain programs worked. The other thing that environment diagrams will do, or memory diagrams, you'll hear us use both of these terms somewhat interchangeably, is they will help set the stage for more complex ideas that you'll encounter later in this course. And those complex ideas are much easier to understand once we have the fundamentals of the mechanics under the hood. Certain ideas such as recursion, which is the ability for a function to call itself, are totally mind-blowing when you don't really have a model for how this would work and how to keep track of that. Um, but with our diagrams, we'll have a better solution there. So the time that we invest learning these now will pay dividends as we try to learn more complex subjects in the near future. So what does environment diagram look like? Well, there's gonna be two parts to it. And we see one that has some elements we'll, we won't discuss today, but we'll get to soon. There are two parts to an environment diagram or two areas of memory that we generally are concerned with. The call stack is going to contain the functions that we're working with and their variables. And the heap is going to contain uh, what we call objects or reference types, including our function definitions, including uh, lists of strings and things like that. All right, so we'll come back and discuss these areas in more depth in just a moment. We'll spend more time on the heap as we move into uh, using more complex objects, such as lists that can store many values of any type. Right? They're a sequence, like a string is a sequence, but they'll allow us to store things that are bigger than characters uh, in a sequential uh, arrangement. All right. What we're doing here is we're roughly approximating what's actually happening behind the scenes. There's details we're glossing over. There's some things we're waving our hands about and, and kind of not looking too closely or thinking too closely about them. As you continue on your computer science journey, you'll unravel some of those things. Um, but, but we're trying to choose a level of abstraction that is uh, appropriate for better understanding how our programs actually work, All right? So let's imagine this particular example where we've got a two functions defined followed by a call to main. So the first function is main and notice it has a return type of none. Uh, so it's a procedure. And uh, the second function is f 
and it has one parameter and a return type of int. And then the call to main occurs down on line 12. Now, as we looked at previously, typically in a Python program, uh, we should have an if statement here, like if and then un double underscore name, uh, underscore name is equal to, and then underscore main, right? So this idiom in Python for uh, making a program both runnable as a program, but also one that you can import its functions from and it doesn't start running automatically, we would normally use that idiom. Uh, but here we're saying, okay, we're never going to assume that you're importing these functions somewhere else. So we're not gonna use that idiom. And this is really just to simplify our tracing example here. So we're just going to call main when we get to line 12, okay? So we're gonna be tracing through this example using an environment diagram step-by-step. -step. And what we'll do is we'll learn how to establish a frame for main. We'll establish some local variables. We'll learn how to call a function and these types of things. So what we're gonna do is jump right into it. And for these slides, I'm using a white background so that if you want to practice on your own, you can print off, say, this example slide and start tracing through it on paper. Uh, otherwise, uh, short of printing this out, I would encourage following along with pencil and paper and actually writing out each step. Right? So when a Python module evaluates, we start at the very top and for that given module evaluation, we assume that our globals is, is kind of empty. There actually are some special reserved things set up here that Python is doing in the background, like our double underscore name variable and some other special things. But those are specific to Python, and we're not going to worry about trying to illustrate them in these diagrams. All right? So there are some other built-ins, like some functions that are defined, like print uh, is technically already defined at this point, but we're not going to worry about built-ins. We're only focused on what is important to our program specifically. When a function definition is encountered, we're going to take its name and bind its name on our current, where, wherever we currently are, uh, our current frame on the stack. So uh, we call this a frame and each frame has, a, uh, has some context associated with it. And this, this frame is the globals frame. And inside of the frame, any names that we define, like any functions that we define are gonna be bound here. Uh, if we had defined some named constants, they would also be bound here. And we'll look at that in a future example. Here we're defining that main, this main function that we're, is bound to. And for now, we're just going to uh, illustrate the, the definition of this function as saying, uh, we write in a box on the heap and then we'll label it fn for function. Uh, and then it's lines one through four. So the, if we wanted to figure out um, what does this, uh, what does this object on the heap actually refer to? Well, it's the function who's defined on lines one through four, which are these, right? Great, so we've got this main function definition. And so now the name main has meaning in our program. We've defined it and we've bound it, right? Great. Same thing with f, right? No difference between these two things. We define a function named f, so now the function, uh, now the name f is bound to this function definition that spans from lines seven to nine, all right? So now if we use the name f later in our program, we know that we're talking about this function who's defined on lines seven through nine. The next thing that happens after these two definitions are read, and remember, we're not actually calling those functions yet. Uh, on line 12 we are when we get to line uh, 12, but at this point, we just evaluated these definitions. So we've got these recipes or subprograms stored on our heap, and they're bound to names on the call stack. Well, when we reach this call to main, that's when we say, okay, what is main? Do we even know what main is? And so we have to use a process called name resolution. And with name resolution, we say, let's look in our current frame on the stack. And for all we know, globals is the only frame on the stack. So we're gonna look at globals, all right? And we ask, is the name main found in globals? And yes, it's found in globals and it's bound to the function that's defined on lines one through four, right? So this is the function we're referring to. And we know that because the name has been associated with it. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna do uh, in, in, in a question here that I, before we get into this function call, let's address one thing. Why, why do we have these function calls to main at the very end of our programs? And this was true even in the eight ball example where we have the if name is equal to main, then call main. Well, it's because of this exact phenomenon that we need these names to be defined. We need our functions to be defined before we actually go and start evaluating our main function. If we had uh, written this call to main 
up above the definition, right? The program would have evaluated this first before it reached the definition and the name main would not have been bound to anything in the call stack and it would have, we would have had a name resolution error, all right? So the reason why we put the main call at the very end is so that we are able to uh, have our functions defined before we evaluate it. Okay, so what happens when we reach a function call? And this is the most important set of steps for this video. We're gonna see this twice because we're also gonna call the function f. So when you reach a function call, first you check, does this function even exist? And sure enough, it did. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a frame to our call stack, right? So what we're doing here is we're adding this frame and we're gonna label the frame whatever the function's name was. So in this case, it was main. We're going to write in the return address, which is the line of code that that function call evaluated on, right? So this function call occurred on line 12. When this function returns and finishes, that's where we're gonna go back with our result, right? And then what we're gonna do is check to see, are there any parameters that need to be passed in from arguments? Well, in this case, notice our argument list for this main function call is empty. And that's okay because the parameter list of the main function definition is also empty, right? So there's no parameter passing that needs to occur. If there was, and there will be when we get to F, there'll be some other steps we would do here, but there's not. So what we're ready to do is we're ready to jump in to the main function and start processing its statements from top to bottom, right? So the first thing we reach is a variable initialization step and or statement. And notice that that variable is being defined in the current frame on the stack. The current frame is going to be the lowest frame on our stack that is yet to return. Right? And so in this case, we're in the main function. It hasn't returned yet. And so what we're doing is we're setting up some space. We're binding the name X to the value four. Okay. On the next line, we see that we've got a uh, more complex statement. That's an initialization statement. And we know when we don't have just a literal value on our right hand side, our first job when we reach a statement like this line is gonna to be to evaluate the right-hand side because we need this to be a single value, right? We need to evaluate this expression and be sure that it returns an integer. Well, notice that we've got a function call expression here. We're calling the function f of x, right? And when we have a function call expression, we've got a sequence of steps we need to follow. Does the function name f exist? Yes, it does. Uh, do the parameter types match up? and the number. Well, there's one value here that's x. x's type is int. Uh, there's one, uh, sorry, there's one argument here, x, and x's type is int. And there's one parameter defined on this f function, its type is int, so that checks out, that's okay. The next thing we need to do is we need to evaluate our arguments. Here, we've got f of x. Well, let's evaluate x, right? We need to figure that value out first. So x, we look it up using name resolution and x's value is four currently in our frame on the stack. So we would say this call to f of x is going to evaluate in one step to f of four, but we still haven't fully evaluated this function call yet, all right? So we're making progress, and now we need to move through the steps of setting up this function call frame, all right? So we've already talked through this step. What is f? Well, f is bound to the function defined on line seven through nine. And so that means we look at line seven through nine, we check that definition and say, hey, do these uh, arguments match up with the parameters? And we could also check does the return type, this function returns an integer and we're trying to return the, uh, assign the result to an integer variable. So that checks out too, all right? So we know that f of x is going to have x evaluate to four. We just looked up the value of x, right? We evaluated that argument. So now we have the important function call uh, establishment step, where we're going to establish a frame in order to process this function call, right? So what are we doing here? Well, we've got this f of four is where we're at, right? So what do we do? Well, we add a frame to our call stack. So that's this box here. And we're going to label that frame with the function name, which is f, that's the function we're calling. We're gonna set up the return address. We're returning back to line th three, right? This is the line where we need to send the return value, whatever this function returns, we'll send it back to there. And uh, so we mark three in our return address, the RA. And then this time around, we actually do have parameter passing, right? We have this argument value four that needs to be assigned to this parameter N. So when a function call involves parameters, we need to set up on that function calls frame, 
here the parameter n is being assigned the argument value for, right? So that's how the parameter passing step works. And once we've got our return address set up, once we've got our parameters fully passed in, that's when we jump into that function definition. And notice that these return addresses are keeping track of our trail of bookmarks. So when this function call is done, we'll go back to line three. When main is done, we will go back to line 12, which is uh, at the last line of our program, right? And so return addresses are our trail of bookmarks that we can return back to with values. But for now, we're about to jump in to line eight and we need to go evaluate this F function call. So we reach this F function call and another initialization statement. And here, we once again need to evaluate the right-hand side first. So we see that, okay, we've got N plus one and, uh, oops, go back to that. So we've got n plus one, and we need to evaluate this expression, break it down into its uh, simpler parts. So n is going to evaluate to four, right? We look in our current value or our current frame on the stack. That's the lowest frame that hasn't returned, and that's the f frame. And we see that n is its value is four, all right? So we continue on, we would substitute four there. Four plus one is going to be five. And then we're going to initialize x to be five. Notice, that when you declare and initialize a variable in a function call expression evaluation, that variable is established in the frame that you're currently working in. So in this frame for f, notice we have an x variable whose value is five, and that's different from main, where main also had an x variable whose value is four. And so it's totally fine for the same variable name to be used in two different meanings in two different functions and have two different values bound to each of those names because they're bound only within the frame of that function, right? So here we have an X variable whose value is five and that's okay. Uh, and then on the next line, <clears throat> you notice that we are hitting the return statement and that return statement is returning whatever X evaluates to. Well, let's go look up X, what is X? We look in our current frame on the stack. Sure enough, we do have an X variable to find its value is five. So what we're saying is return five. And when we reach a return statement in a function call, we on our diagrams are going to add a return value to that frame so that we know that its job is complete. It's done there's nothing else for this function uh, to do at this point. And so five is the value we're returning to line three, right? So with these two pieces of information, we know that the next step is to send the value five back to line three, all right? So here's the value five and we're sending it back to line three. And what do you know? This is where that function call originated from. This is how we got into that function call. And by returning five, we're saying, okay, this function call now evaluates to five. So it's as if we're saying five is going to be, uh, assigned to y, right? So it's as if we're saying f of x is five, and that's gonna be assigned to the initialization of y, which would cause a y variable to be set up in the current frame when we get to this point. And notice, well, what is the current frame that we're working in once we've returned back from f? Well, this frame has a return value associated with it. So that's not the current frame we're working in. The current frame that you're working in at any given point is the lowest frame on your call stack that hasn't returned. So we're back in mains frame and we reach this statement that is initializing y to be five, right? The next thing we do is we continue on and we are printing uh, x comma y. And you can use the print function. It's a special function that allows you to give it multiple arguments. It'll print one after the other. And here we're printing uh, x and y, which is are the values four and five, right? And that would cause four and five to show up on the screen. Now I should notice that print is a function and the same steps that we took to set up parameter passing, to set up a frame and all of that, those same steps are happening when you call this print function. But because that print function is built into the language and imported from somewhere else and we can't even see that code, this is one of those places where we're just kind of wave our hands and say, ah, we're not going to worry ourselves with those details. We're going to assume that print works and we're going to treat it as a black box and we'll just keep track of what gets printed out. Well, in this case, uh, what gets printed out would have been X 
And when we look up, well, what is X? We're gonna look in the current frame. Notice that's still mains frame. So we would print out uh, four and then five would follow it, all right? So four and five would be the printed evaluation of this example. Right. Well, we're not done yet. We haven't completed our program, right? Our main function still hasn't returned. So there's something that's special that happens when we reach the end of a procedure, right? And I've talked about uh, the print statement in these slides for reference that you can go back to, all right? When you reach the end of a procedure, which is a function that returns none, notice there's no return statement here. So what do we do? Well, we're gonna have this convention that says, uh, we just say there's a return value entry here, which we use the null character, or we, we think of this as short of for none or nothing. And we do leave an entry here that says, okay, this function has, it's not returning anything, but it's reached its end. There's nothing else for it to do, right? There, the next thing we see is the start of another function. And we know that that's, that means that the main function has ended. There's no more, uh, there are no more statements that belong to it. So when we return none, the same return semantics apply where we say, okay, let's take this return value, which is none, right? You could also write in the word none if you'd prefer, that's fine. They mean the same thing for our purposes. So we're saying none is what's being returned. And where are we, what are we doing with none? Well, we're sending that back to line 12. Well, line 12 is where the function called a main occurred. And so this function called a main would evaluate to the value none, which is useless. Uh, and then our program would continue on from here, but we've actually reached the end of it, so our program would complete and it's done. If we had put a print statement after this call to main, then at this point, or, or some other code after this call to main, then that code would be evaluated then. Uh, typically, for structuring our program's purposes, we're gonna put main at the top, uh, the definition of main at the top, and then the call to main at the bottom, and any functions that main depends on in between. So this is a first look at environment diagrams and memory diagrams, and we're gonna get a lot of practice with this through the semester. At first, it's gonna feel like there are a number of rules, and we'll provide some, uh, some shorter uh, cheat sheets that have the rules listed out that you need to follow. Uh, but as you gain practice with this, you'll start to be more, much more comfortable with how function calls work and some of the limitations, but also features that we have in protecting functions, variables from one another through the use of these frames.